everyone and welcome back to The Journey. Today, as you can see, we're going to be talking about women's health and particularly the herpes uh, simplex virus, okay? Also known as the herpes virus type 2 infection or herpes genitalis, okay? So, we're just going to go ahead and just explain what is herpes genitalis, okay? So, it's a reoccurring lifelong viral infection that causes um, the herpes lesions or so. They look like blisters and they're going to be on the external genitalia area and they may occasionally be in the vagina or the cervix, okay? Also, um, if you guys didn't know, herpes uh, is pretty much an STI, but with this STI, it's almost the same as with HIV, where it's not just only um, transmitted sexually, it can also be transmitted asexually, okay? And in this particular uh, area, it can be transmitted through um, wet, wet services or so. So let's say you have the herpes, um, Lesions or so, they're open, they're they're wet, and they they they're they're pouring out, you know, with the with the pus and all that stuff, right? As long as you have an open orifice or an open area or so, and you touch someone else, right? That person can now get it, especially if around the genitalia area, right? Because it can go into the body. Okay, so again, these are how um, the genitalia, the herpes genitalia, can be transmitted. Okay, so it's not just only sexually. It also can be transmitted from person to person or from what surfaces of that of that person um, with the with the, with the infections. Okay. Also, um, you have the initial infection. The initial infection, sorry, is pretty much very painful, um, but lasts about a week. So the, the initial is going to be very painful, but it lasts about a week. Any, any other occurrences after that eventually is not as bad, okay? So, they are they can also be asymptomatic, which pretty much means that they show no symptoms, all right? Um, also, they can have reoccurrences that are associated with stress, with sunburn, um, with not eating properly, right? Because you have a uh, lack of nutrition. It can be because of inadequate rest. Anything that compromises the immune system. So, anything that compromises the immune system is going to flare up those um, those lesions to occur, okay? And you may be saying, okay, you're talking about type two, where's type one? Type one is pretty much the common uh, herpes um, virus that you see that people have when they have the cold sores. It mainly rests around the lips or so, and you'll see it on TV, they have like, different ointments and stuff that they can put on it. It's not life-threatening, um, so that's why you don't really see they talk about it mainly in the books. It mainly focuses on the type two because type two can cause um, different complications, um, it's harder to treat, right? But that's pretty much from a genetic standpoint. So those of you guys who um, may experience the cold sores and things like that, yes, it is a herpes virus, it's type one, type one, but it's not too critical, okay? You can, it, it pretty much goes away, it flares up whenever the, um, the temperature changes and things like that, where, when it's really, really cold, um, or it can be really, really hot, it depends on the person, but it flares up based on the atmosphere and what's going on with that patient. Um, it can also come up when the patient has a cold and they're very sick. So again, um, that's nothing to worry about. The main thing you wanna focus more on is the type two, which is why I'm discussing the type two, okay? But just in case you guys wanted to know what's type one, type one is the cold source, okay? Also, um, the lesions increase vulnerability to HIV and other STIs. So now that you have this, um, infection, so you're more prone to having other types of um, STIs or HIV to come into your body, okay? And the vaccines for this is still in the clinical trial, so right now there is no cure for herpes, which is why I said it's a long, a lifelong viral infection, okay? And pretty much just try to control the symptoms. So now we're going to talk about the clinical manifestations, which is also known as your signs and symptoms, which is also your nursing assessment, right? So you're going to have itching and pain when the area becomes red and very edematous, all right? And the edema just pretty much swelling of fluid and you can have the pitting um, either from plus one, plus two, plus three, or plus four pitting, okay? Also, you have macules and papules, which eventually, um, once they have gotten into a more advanced state, they will progress to vesicles and ulcers, okay? And you have the vascular state, which is pretty much the blisters, which is um, oscillates or so, and it encrusts around around the surface okay so it pretty much hardens all right started off soft and it has a little papule you can you know um, it can still be a part of the healing process and then eventually 
as as it as it gets older and older, it starts to form a crust and it can cause ulcers. Okay, depending on how how much of the skin or how much irritation has gone to that area. Um, the next thing you have is in, within women, the labia, which is pretty much the the outer part, the lips. All right is the most common area where you, the lesions will occur. But they also have areas as far as the cervix, the vagina, and the perianal um, skin, okay? It may, it may also form there as well, all right? In male, it is the gland penis, the foreskin, and the penile shaft, okay? And those areas, you will see the lesions appear there. Those are the typical um, areas that are affected, all right? Then you have your influenza-like symptoms that may occur three to four days after the lesion appears, okay? So this is your, you know, running nose, coughing, sneezing, right? Anything that's like your flu-like, all right? Next you have is your inguinal lymphadenopathy, which is pretty much a large lymph, lymph node, um, an enlarged lymph node area within the groin area, all right? Um, you have your mild fever, malaise or headache. You can have myelalgia, which is pretty much aching of the muscles. You have dysuria, which is pain on urination, and um, your lesion can subside in about 4 to 15 days if there isn't any secondary in, in infection. Now we're on the complications of herpes, all right? So you have aseptic um, meningitis, you have neonatal transmission. So with the neonatal transmission, a C-section is going to be required, okay? Most of the times they say um, if, she, if the mother has active lesions and they're actually present, then she's supposed to have a C-section. If not, then she can go ahead and have a vaginal birth. I'd rather be safe, and if the patient, you know, has herpes or so, I'd rather recommend the mother to just have a C-section, just because you never know. Um, she thought she may think that, you know, there isn't anything there, and there may be one little small lesion somewhere around the vaginal or within the vagina, you know, that you're not able to see or um, you overlook, or just not able to pick up on the on the actual visual um, examination. Okay. So I just rather those mothers just, you know, have a C-section so that way the transmission doesn't come on the baby itself, okay? So again, that lets you know that transmission is from skin to skin, right? And a baby is more vulnerable because, remember, they're still um, creating their immune system. So fighting off those, those, those infections is going to be harder than a person who is in an adult age, okay? So again, um, severe emotional stress. Um, is where you're going to see those lesions start to appear. So the patient may have um, emotional stress that you may want to, you know, ask them, you know, what are some ways that you cope with stress? You know, is it listening to music? Is it going to sleep? Is it, um, you know, working out, exercising, and try to, you know, um, create strategies that can kind of help with them with the emotional um, um, severe stress that they're going through, okay? Also, the spread of the lesions can happen to the thigh, the buttocks, area um, or the eyes as well okay it's very rare but it can happen to some people and of course you want to educate and, and you want to do this for yourself is to wash hands after contact okay so after contact you want to wash your hands that is the best way to kind of prevent infections from spreading is washing with the hands okay also medical management so again like i said earlier there's no cure for hsv2 which is pretty much herpes simplex virus type 2 infection all right, the treatment is just pretty much to alleviate uh, or give relief to the symptoms. So you have antiviral agents, also known as acyclovir, which I put the trade names in parentheses. You have viloxiclovir, um, and then you have semiciclovir, okay? So if you notice, they all have that common trend of the acyclovir, okay? So anytime you see acyclovir, that lets you know um, that these are your herpes medication, all right? And what they do is pretty much they're going to shorten, shorten the course of the infection and suppress the symptoms, all right? That's what they're going to do. They also reduce the duration of the lesions and preventing reoccurrence from, from happening, okay? And if you are in a reoccurring episode, um, they're often milder, okay, um, than the initial episode. Also, you, the management of goals is to pretty much prevent the spread, okay? You want to make sure that it stays contained, whether it's going to be in the labia, whether, wherever it is, you want to make sure that it stays in that area, it only appears in that area, you don't want it to spread, all right? Also, you want to make the patient comfortable, you want to decrease the potential health risk, 
and you want to initiate counseling and education programs. Okay, so again, counseling is going to be a lot of times when you have patients that has STDs um, or have STIs, right? The main thing that you want to do is pretty much be there to educate, 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 because some of these things can be prevented. Uh, most of these things can be prevented, at least when it comes to the sexually transmitted diseases or infection, just because you can control who your sex partner is going to be, right? So you want to make sure that you educate them about safe sex, about um, about making sure that you know they're aware that skin-to-skin -skin contact can still cause a patient to have herpes. So even if the person has on the condom, right, as long as they're skin-to-skin -skin contact, you can now get herpes as well. So you want to make sure that you're tested, you know, that the other patient, the other partner is tested as well to know exactly what's going on, what's happening, right? Um, another thing as well, you want to make sure that you're counseling them, right? Because imagine someone's telling you for the first time that you have this STI that you have to live with for the rest of your life. How would that make you feel, right? You want to make sure that you have that emotional support there, that encouragement to let you know that, hey, you can still live a normal life, that, you know, you can still, you know, achieve the, the goals you want to achieve, have the career that you want to have, that it's not a life-threatening thing, and um, those those things are going to help um, the patient move on and move forward, especially, you know, the fact that they're probably being down on themselves that, you know, how could they let this happen to them? You also want to uh, teach them never to assume, you know, you, it could be the most beautiful patient, the most ugliest patient, the most biggest patient, the most skinniest patient. doesn't matter. Whatever it is that you're attracted to, it doesn't matter, right? Disease sees no, um, no favoritism. Okay, so again, you want to educate them, let them know the, the prevention factors and things like that. And last but not least, nursing interventions. All right, so again, like I was saying before, you want to relieve the pain and the lesion should be kept clean and dry and use the proper hygiene, okay? Also, you can use cyst baths, and with a cyst bath, it's pretty much like warm water or so, um, and the patient will kind of just pretty much sit in the tub and... Um, you know, kind of flush out the vagina area and kind of soothe um, whatever pain that they may have if the lesions are within the vagina, uh, around the, the vagina or, the, or the, the labia, right? Just sitting, in, sitting in, the, in the cool water or warm water can kind of help alleviate some of that pain, all right? Um, also, you want to make sure that the patient is wearing loose clothing, everything is not too tight down there, that it's kind of loose so that way, um, you know, it's breathable space and things like that. If the lesions are there, they can dry, you know, because they're not um, in a tight, sweaty, you know, hot place, okay? Also, you want to avoid occlusive ointments and powders, those talcum powders and things like that. You want to avoid those, all right? I put that in red so you guys can see you want to avoid them. And the reason why is because they prevent the lesions from drying. And the whole point is that you want the lesions to dry because when they dry, they're able to heal and from then on, they can kind of um, um, go into their latent, latent stage, okay, before they reoccur again. Also, you want to provide bed rest for these, these patients. You also want to prevent the spreading of the infection, so hand washing is going to be key. So any questions with hand washing, hand washing, hand washing, that is your biggest thing, okay? Because you don't want to spread the, the area. Also, you want to use a barrier method um, with sexual contact, right? Because again, even if you use a condom, as long as you're touching skin to skin, you can still get it, okay? So you want to make sure that you're using a barrier um, protected protection, okay? Also, medication regimen, that they're staying on their medication regimen, all right? You may, a lot of times, the reason why patients are not on their regimen is because they feel as if they're getting better. And the reason why they're getting better is because of the medication. You stop that medication, you go right back to where you were before. So you want to make sure that you're, um, you're teaching the patient to keep, keep up with their medication regimen, all right? Also, you want to relieve any anxiety. Sometimes the biggest anxiety is the fact that they don't know any information about what's going on. And you can just kind of think about it yourself, right? If you had a, a disease or you had something and you had no information about it, you're going to have so much anxiety just, just because you're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what's going on, I have this disease. But once you, you hear about the disease, you, then you know the complications, you know the signs and symptoms, you know what to expect, right? Sometimes just knowing kind of help to alleviate some of that anxiety just because you're like, okay, 
I'm not dying. I know what's going on, right? So you want to make sure that, you know, the, if the anxiety is because of a lack of information, that you want to provide that information to them. Now, if it's because of anxiety, because, you know, even after hearing all that information, they're still like, oh, but what if this and what if that? Because they're going to be concerned about, you know, their sexual partners and informing them and, you know, different things that, that are going to affect them day, to, day, day by day. Right? You want to listen to your patient, right? Listen to them. What are the, what are your concerns? What makes you anxious, right? You want to listen to them. Um, you also want to provide information about support groups. Let them know that they're not alone, that there's many people out there who have herpes, right? And sometimes being in a support group kind of help um, you hear someone else's side of the story of how they deal with herpes or how they manage with it on a day-to-day -day basis, okay? So you also want to give support as a nurse yourself, okay? And just be encouraging to these, these patients and teaching. Last thing is teaching. You want to have your patient teaching. Make sure that they know the concerns. Make sure that they know the risks. Make sure that they know, um, you know, the safety measures to kind of prevent these things from happening and occurring, right? So, again, these are all the things for your nurse interventions for a patient who has herpes um, simplex virus. Again, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please subscribe. If you have any questions or any comments or anything that you just want to say, you can put it in the comment section below. And remember to check out the description box for more information. And again, have a great, blessed day.